Hey, welcome to How to Play, brought to you by The Games Capital. Today we're looking at a monster of a game. The game is Caverna, The Cave Farmers, and the designer of this game is the same guy that's responsible for Agricola, Le Havre, Aura and Labora, At the Gates of Loyang, a number of resource management type games. Now this game is for one to seven players. I can't imagine trying to play with seven players. You would need an awfully big table, but the option is there. Now, it's very similar to Agricola. If you've played Agricola before, you're gonna find this game fairly easy to pick up. If you haven't played Agricola or any of those games that I mentioned before, they're fairly complex. They're not terribly difficult to learn, but there's lots of things going on. So there's a little bit to take in. Okay, so before we get into how the game actually plays, let's have a look at what's in the box. And it's a big box. Well, you can see by the size of this box and how deep it is, there's a lot of stuff in this game. This box is absolutely chock-a-block full of bits. So what are they? Well, first of all, each player will get one of these player boards. Now depicted on the player board is a cave system. So what's gonna happen here is you're gonna develop this cave system by building tunnels and caves and then rooms in those caves. And on the other side is a forest which you'll clear in order to build your farm. So each player gets one of those. Then in the center of the table, we have action boards. Now this initial action board has a number of actions on it. It's double-sided. Depending on the number of players, you'll use one side or the other. In addition to that, there's also these extra player boards, also double-sided, which come into play depending on the number of players that are going to be in the game. Then there's two additional boards that are placed alongside that board, and they also depict some actions and also some empty spaces, which are gonna receive actions each round as the game progresses. So there'll be more things that you can do as the game goes on. Then there are tiles that you use to build your cave system and your farm. So first of all, we'll look at the cave tiles. So we've got double tiles, which in this instance depict a tunnel and also an open cave. They're double-sided. On the other side, there's two caves. So depending on the configuration that you're after, you would use either side of those to build your cave system. There's also single tiles that have tunnels on one side, caves on the other. Then there's also mines. So this tile has a mine, an ore mine rather, and also what we refer to as a deep tunnel. Now this tunnel goes further down and that's significant in the game as well. Also, there is a ruby mine, which is on a single tile, which you can also build in your cave system. Then on the other side, on the forest side, you're gonna be clearing that in order to build your farm. And the options you have in your farm are going to be using these tiles, which have on one side a field where you can pasture animals, and on the other side, a place where you can plant crops. Once again, there are also single tiles that you can use for uh, configuring your farm of both types. Uh, as well as that, the pastures where you keep animals sometimes need to be fenced. So there's also tiles that depict the fences on a single tile and also on a double tile. So they're the tiles that you will use to build your farm and your cave. As well as that, there are also building tiles. Now the building tiles will go into the caves that you have built, so they'll go on there. And there's a whole heap of different buildings that you can build. Some of them are dwellings where additional uh, workers will be placed so that you can carry out more action. So each worker will need a room to live in. But a lot of the other rooms just do a whole heap of different things and give you various advantages during the game. Now there's additional boards that I haven't put out because there's not enough room. But this is where the buildings are placed at the start of the game. So there's four boards that have room for buildings. Once again, these are double sided. And the game gives you two options. You can play an introductory game where, for example, on this board there are six buildings laid out. If you want to play the more advanced game, on the flip side of this board, there's space for 12 buildings. So 
The advanced game has more buildings in it, which makes the game a little bit more complex, but gives you more options as well. So once again, four boards with a whole heap of buildings that get placed out as well. There's also wooden pieces in the game. Now each player will have a series of little discs which, rep which represent the workers that he has or the dwarves that are going to be sent out to do various actions. You have five of those and at the start of the game you're allowed to put two of them into the two rooms that are depicted on your player board. They're the only two workers that you have at the start of the game. You also have these little wooden houses which represent stables and they come into play during the game as well for housing animals and other things. There are also wooden resources. Now first of all we have timber and stone. These are used obviously to build things during the game. There's also crops that you can plant. So we've got wheat and also vegetables that you plant in those fields that we mentioned earlier. The mines produce ore and rubies, which also are very useful. And there's also animals in the game. Now there's five different animal types, four of which are considered to be farm animals. And there's also a dog. So the dogs are not considered to be farm animals, but come in quite handy. Then our farm animals are cattle, sheep, pigs, and also donkeys. There's also little cardboard tokens representing gold in various denominations, which you'll collect during the game. There's also food tokens, which are very important because you're going to have to feed your workers during the game. So that's something you need to keep in mind. And there's also cards. Now the cards, this deck of cards, represents the new actions that are going to be coming out every turn. So each turn we'll flip over one of these and add it to the board to give you more options as the game plays. And there is also some reference cards which each player will get. There's two of those which give you information that you're going to need during the game. In addition to that, there's one more thing that I forgot to mention, and that is these little tiles here, which are shields. And during the game, there's an option to go on expeditions. In order to go on an expedition, your dwarf or your worker is going to need one of these shields. And they come in different denominations. The larger the number, the more effective your expedition is going to be. But we'll get to that in a moment. So as you can see, there's lots of different bits that uh, come into play during this game. Just to give you an idea of the amount of things there are, there are bags and bags of these components that come with the game. Heaps and heaps of stuff. It's a challenge to get them back into the box. Anyway, that's all of the components. So how do you play Caverna? Well, let's have a look at the setup first. So the setup for this game is fairly straightforward. You take the action boards, you place them in the middle of the table. You'll also need to get these building tiles somewhere where they're easily accessible and place all of the buildings, appropriate buildings onto those tiles. Then make sure you've got all the resources in their various stacks and piles. It's gonna take up a bit of space, but they need to be within easy reach of everybody. Once you've done that, uh, you'll decide on a start player. The start player will get this little token to indicate that they are the start player. Each person will receive a number of food tokens at the start of the game, depending on the player order. So the first player generally gets less, and as you go around the table, uh, those players will receive slightly more food uh, to begin the game. Then you take the action cards, which are divided into round numbers, so you'll take each section of round numbers, give them a little shuffle to randomise them, and then place them in order in a stack. Then the first thing you do is turn over the top card and place it onto the number one space. And that action now will be available for round one. Then there's also these little tokens that look like so. There's a few of those that you will randomly shuffle and assign to various spaces on the board where you see that matching icon. Now they have either a green leaf or a red question mark on them. And that will come into play as those rounds occur and will affect uh, gameplay at that point, which I will explain when we get to that. That's basically it. Once you've done all of that, you're ready to go with turn one. 
So let's have a look at how you play. First of all, as I mentioned before, the first thing you do is take one of these action cards and place it on the current round spot, and that gives you a new action each turn. Now once you've done that, you need to replenish the board. So you'll notice that a number of the action spaces have a little circle with an arrow and a resource type pictured within that circle. So each of those spaces needs to be replenished. So the number next to the resource uh, icon indicates how many of that resource. So on this first spot, two stone are placed onto that uh, location. You do the same for every spot where there's that same symbol and these resources accumulate. So even if there's already resources on that space, they will get new resources. So as the game progresses, they can build up and become quite valuable uh, to take the action at that spot. So after the board is completely replenished, then you begin the actions. The start player will take their first token, place it out somewhere onto the board, and take the action associated with the spot. Then the next player will do the same, and so on. Once it comes back around to the start player again, he'll take his next action token and take a second action, and so on. Once all of the player's uh, tokens are out on the board, then their workers will return home. And then, depending on the situation and what round you're in, there may be what we refer to as a harvest. Now, in the first two rounds of the game, there's no harvest. From then on, there may be a harvest during the round. Now, I'm not going to go into what the harvest does at the moment. We'll wait until we've explained a little bit more about the game and then it will make sense. But after the harvest has concluded, then you basically start the next round by placing a new action out onto the board and replenish and so on. That's how the gameplay works for the entire game till you get to turn 12. After turn 12, that's the end of the game. You count up your scores for what you've achieved during the game. The person with the highest score is the winner. So now we really need to know what all of the actions do so that you know what you can accomplish during the game. So let's have a look at those one at a time. So you'll notice that a lot of the action spaces have actually two parts to them and in many instances you can either do both of those parts of the action or you have a choice of doing one or the other. So the first action on the board is called Drift Mining. Now with Drift Mining you can take the resources that are there, so in this case it will be stone and there could be any number of stone there. So you get to take all of the stone that is on that tile and then you also get to build in your cave system one of these tiles which depicts a tunnel and also a cave. Now it has to be that exact tile, not the reverse. So you get to place that onto your cave wherever you like. Now you'll notice that on your cave board there are a couple of spots where the food icon is pictured. Now if you build your cave and tunnel over the top of that spot, then you also get to take an extra food into your supply, or if you get to do it up here, an extra two food. Also, important, when you are building your cave, you must build from an existing location. So you can't take this tile and just place it up here on its own. It has to come from one of your already existing caves. So that's drift mining, a way to build your tunnels in the game. The next action on the board is called imitation. Imitation has a cost associated with it. You need to pay two food in order to use the action. But what it allows you to do is to take an action that somebody else has already used. Now normally, once a player takes an action on the board, that action is locked out to all the other players. So imitation gives you an opportunity to use an action that has already been used by somebody else. It could be quite useful. The next action space is called logging. Now logging potentially will have timber sitting on that space, which you're allowed to take, whatever is there. And then the second part of that action is an expedition. Now in order to go on an expedition, your dwarf would need to be equipped with one of these little shield tiles. Now we haven't got to the action that allows you to equip your dwarf yet, so we won't discuss that just at the moment. Once we get to that tile, we'll talk about how an expedition works. The next action is forest exploration. This also is a space that will accumulate timber, which you can take whatever is on that particular space. 
In addition to that, you also get two food to add to your supply. Excavation is the next action. And once again, there is stone available to take on that particular space. Then you also have a choice of building one of these tunnels and caves in your cave. But unlike drift mining, here you have the option to either use the side that has the tunnel and the cave, or the side that has two caves. So if you're interested in building more rooms, then you'll want to use the cave side. If you want tunnels, then obviously the other side, but the choice is yours. Then comes the action referred to as growth. Now in this instance, you have a choice of one or the other of these particular actions. The first action that you can take is to receive one timber, one stone, one ore, one food, and also two gold from the supply. So quite a number of different things you get there. Or if you don't want to take that, you can have an additional family member to add to your uh, cave system. Now, in order to do that, this particular worker must have a room in your cave. So before you can take that action, you must have built a room previously. Then comes clearing. Now clearing allows you to take the timber that's located on that action space and then also clear a space in your forest for one of these tiles that depicts a field and also a pasture. Now, similarly to the cave system, there are also these little food icons and also there's an icon for a pig. Once again, if you cover those spaces up, you get to take either the food or the pig into your supply. And just like the cave system, you have to build from the cave entrance out. You can't start up here at the other end of your farm. So that's what clearing allows you to do. The next action space is the starting player space. Now, on this particular space, you actually get three things. First of all, you get to take the starting player token, and on the next turn, you will be the start player. You also get to take whatever food has accumulated on that spot, and in addition to that, you'll get one ruby. Now, what do rubies do? Well, rubies are awesome. You can basically use rubies during the game at any time to swap for virtually anything that you want of the resource types. You can swap it for animals, for uh, timber, stone, some of these uh, crops you can use. You can even swap rubies for one of these single tiles to place onto your board. So rubies are very useful. In addition to that, they're also worth one point at the end of the game if you have any of them left over, but much more useful for swapping for the things that you need during the game. Ore mining is the next spot. Here you will take whatever ore is sitting on that particular space. You'll get an additional two ore for every ore mine that you may have already constructed in your cave system. That's ore mining. Sustenance is the next action space. Here you'll find accumulating grain and potentially vegetables as well on that spot. And in addition, in addition to taking those, you get to clear some of your forest and place one of these uh, field and pasture tiles out onto the board as well. Ruby mining is the next action that you get to take. Here you get to take whatever rubies have accumulated and in addition to that, you'll get one extra ruby if you have at least one ruby mine in your cave system. The next action space is called housework. When you take that action, first of all, you take one dog and add it to your player board. Now dogs are great. They can go anywhere on the board. There's no restriction. All of the other animals that you'll collect during the game have certain restrictions on where they can be placed. But a dog can go anywhere. Now a dog can be quite useful. If you place a dog into a field, that dog can look after sheep in that field. Now normally, to place sheep in a field, the field would have to be fenced. 
However, if you have a dog in there, you can place one more sheep than there are dogs in that particular field. So one dog will look after two sheep, two dogs will look after three sheep, and so on, without the need for a fence. So that's what dogs are used for. The second part of that action is furnishing a cavern. So if you've created a cave space in your cave system, then you can potentially build one of these rooms that will be on the room board. Now each of the rooms has a cost associated with it, uh, often in either timber, stone or perhaps even ore. You pay that cost and then you place the building onto that empty cave and then you'll get to use the ability of that building. As I mentioned before, some of the buildings are dwellings, so you'll need to build those in order to increase the members of your family to be able to carry out more actions. But other buildings allow special advantages for you during the game. So that's the housework space. Slash and Burn is the last of the predetermined action spaces that are available. Now what you get to do with Slash and Burn is take one of these tiles, clear an area on your player board and place that out. In addition to that, you also potentially get to plant some crops. So you can plant up to two new grain fields and two new vegetable fields. Now when you plant those into the crop spaces, you do it this way. You'll take the one that you've got, place it into the field, and then you'll get two additional wheat tokens to place on top of that to indicate the growth of that particular type of crop. If it's vegetables that you're planting, you'll get an additional one that you'll place on top of that. That will be important when the harvest comes and you get to harvest those particular crops. Now we come to the actions that are found in the action card deck. Now these will come out randomly. Each game is slightly different. But the first one we'll look at is blacksmithing. Now what blacksmithing allows me to do is to forge weapons that will in turn allow me to go on the expeditions that I briefly mentioned earlier. So the first thing that happens is I cash in a number of ore tokens that I might have collected to get one of these shields. Now the number of ore that I give in determines what shield I will get. So if I give eight ore, I'm gonna get a number eight shield. I place that shield onto my worker that I've sent out to carry out that particular action, which means he's now equipped to go on an expedition. Then the second part of the action, there's an icon at the bottom of the card which has a shield and also a number in the center of the shield. The number tells me how many expeditions I can go on on this particular turn. So they vary from one right through to four. So what do I get for going on an expedition? Well, I'll have a look at my reference card, expedition loot, and depending on the value of my shield, that will determine what I can take from that expedition. The number of expeditions tells me how many items I can take and I can select anything from eight down. So I could take uh, a donkey and a pig and I could also take uh, a dog as well or any combination. Now you can only take one of each item so you can't take multiple of the same thing but you get a choice of quite a few things depending on how uh, large your shield is. The shields go up to 14 and obviously the larger the shield the better the items that you get to choose from. In addition to that once you've gone on an expedition you immediately get to upgrade your weapon to the next available one. So I would turn an 8 into a 9 and then next expedition I'll be able to have more choice of things to take. So that's blacksmithing. The next action is ore mine construction. So here, I get to take one of these ore mine tiles and I would need to place it over the top of two existing tunnels in my cave system. So I'd need to have those two tunnels next to each other in order to do it. I get to place that on the board. I also get three ore immediately for discovering the ore mine. And then in addition to that, I also get to go on two expeditions. The next action card is sheep farming. 
Once again, two uh, actions that take place here. First of all, you can build fences around your fields. You pay two wood to fence one tile, or alternatively, you can pay four food and you get to fence a double tile space. Now that will allow you space to house animals. And you can also, at this point, build a stable. Now a stable will go out into either a field or a fenced field. It'll cost you one stone to do that. A stable in an unfenced area allows you to keep one animal on that space. A stable in a fenced area allows you to double the capacity of that particular field. Now normally each fenced area can house two animals. So with a stable you can fit four animals onto that particular space. As well as that, there's a space at the bottom for sheep to accumulate. So you'll take whatever sheep may be on that particular card as part of the action as well. The next action space, action card, is entitled Wish for Children. Now this particular card will always occur at round four. Every game that's placed in that same spot. It's actually a double-sided card and during the game it will flip over to the other side uh, at a certain point. So initially it's set on the Wish for Children side. It allows you to do two actions. You can do one or the other. The first one is family growth, so you get to place another worker on that space and uh, then you'll have an additional worker for the next round. Or you can furnish a dwelling. Now a dwelling is a room for a family member. So you can build one of those buildings if you have space in your cave to do so as part of that action. Then later in the game when it gets flipped over, which I'll explain when we get to that card, the options change for this particular action. It's now called Urgent Wish for Children. And once again you have a choice. You can furnish a dwelling and immediately have an, another uh, worker. Or you can take three gold coins. So that's how that action changes. The next action here is donkey farming. Now donkey farming is very similar to sheep farming. So you still get the option to build fences around your fields and also to build stables if you would like to. Then you get to take whatever donkeys may have accumulated on that particular space. Now donkeys are slightly different to the other animals in the game. They still can go in the fenced in fields, but you can also have one donkey in each of your mines that you have in your cave. So there's another space that you can place donkeys on the board. Then we come to ruby mine construction. So here are two options available to us. You can either build a ruby mine on a standard tunnel, in which case you just get to place the tile. Or if you have previously built an ore mine, which has one of those deep tunnels, if you elect to build your ruby mine on the deep tunnel, then you also get an additional ruby as a reward as well. So you've got a choice of those two options with ruby mine construction. The next action is family life. Now when this particular card comes out, it triggers the turning over of the Wish for Children card. So that immediately flips over to the Urgent Wish for Children option. Then the action that you take for this particular card is Family Growth. So you once again get to have an additional member of your family, providing you have a room, a dwelling for them to live in. And then you also get to plant up to two new grain or two, rather, and two new vegetables into crops that you may have empty on your farming side of the board. So that's family life. The next action is exploration. Now exploration is all about going on expedition. So that's just the single action that you perform. However, you get to go on four different expeditions. So four different items from the list of things that you can collect, you'll bring back as reward for going on those expeditions. The next action is ore delivery. Here, ore and also stone will accumulate. So you'll take whatever is there, 
As well as that, you'll get an additional two ore for every ore mine that you have in your cave system. Then we have the action referred to as ruby delivery. Here, rubies are going to accumulate on the tile. You'll take those plus one additional ruby if you have at least two ruby mines in your cave system. The next action is adventure. Here we have another opportunity to equip a dwarf with a shield. So you'll pay the ore in order to do that. And then you can go on two value one expeditions. Now the reason for that is you can actually, because these are two different expeditions, you could bring back the same two items. So that's adventure. And the final action card is ore trading. Here you can trade two ore for two gold and one food, and you can do that three times. That's ore trading. Now we've looked at actions for a four player game. As I showed you before, there are other boards that come into play with different amounts of players, and these have slightly different actions on them that are available also. But essentially, they're combinations of the same things that we've looked at, with a few exceptions. So let's just have a brief review of the animals in the game and where they can be placed as you collect them. So first of all, the dogs, as mentioned before, the dogs pretty much can go anywhere. There's no real restrictions on where you can place a dog. A dog's quite useful for looking after sheep in an open field that doesn't have a fence. So one dog will look after two sheep, two dogs will look after three sheep, and so on. Also, there are sheep, and as mentioned, the dogs can look after the sheep. Otherwise, the sheep would need to be in a fenced area. And each single square that has a fence can hold two sheep, unless it has a stable, in which case it can hold four sheep. The same applies for pigs, donkeys and cattle, as far as fenced areas are concerned. The pigs can also, or rather one pig, can go next to a stable in a forest. So you don't need to have cleared the forest to look after a single pig next to a stable. Mentioned before also that donkeys can also be housed in the mines that are in your cave system. As well as that, each of those four farm animals can be housed in your entry level dwelling. So already on your board are two rooms. Each of those rooms can hold one animal as a pet. So that's where you can store your animals and how you can go about doing that. Yes, you may well ask how do you get cattle in the first place and to a lesser extent how do you get pigs because there's no action spaces on the board that allow you to uh, collect them. So first of all the pigs, well there's a couple of them available on your board as you clear the space you'll, you'll get those. But the other way to get those two animals is by the use of rubies. So once again using that ruby chart you can certainly cash in one ruby for a pig at any time. And to get a cattle, it's a little bit more expensive, you'll need to pay one ruby and also one food in order to get one cow. Now the harvest will potentially occur at the end of each round. The first two rounds in the game there's no harvest, but from then on there may be a harvest at the end of the round. So at the end of each space on the board, there potentially could be one of these leaf symbols. If there is, that means there's going to be a harvest this round. Now the harvest is divided into three phases. First of all, all of your crops are harvested. Then you must feed all of your family members. And then finally, any animals that you may have could breed. So first of all, the harvest of your field and crops. If you have any planted crops, you will take the top token and return it to your own supply and you can use that then later to plant more crops if the fields are empty or at the end of the game they potentially will be worth points. So that's the first part of the harvest. Then you'll need to give each of your workers two food in order to satisfy them. If you can't feed your workers then you're going to get a begging token. If you get that it's going to be minus three points at the end 
of the game. So you must try and feed your workers. Then finally, the animals that you have in your farm will breed. If you have two or more of a particular animal type, then you'll get an additional animal of that type to add to your farm. Of course, you would need to have somewhere to store that animal, so if you don't have space, then those animals won't breed. So once all of those three phases are completed, then that's the end of the round. You move on to the next round. So that's the basic gameplay for Caverna. Now at the end of the game, after the last round, all you need to do then is add up your points. I've got a little score sheet that allows you to do that. Essentially, you're gonna get points for all of the things that you've collected during the game. So every farm animal and also dog that you've collected is worth a point. If you miss out on a particular animal type, well, that's gonna be minus two points for each type that you're missing. You're also gonna get half a point for every grain and one point for every vegetable that you've got. Every ruby is worth a point. Every dwarf, so every family member that you've got is a point. You'll lose points if there are any spaces on your board that haven't been developed, so if they're still empty. Uh, then you're gonna score points anywhere on tiles where you see a little shield symbol. So the mines give you points, the fenced pastures give you points. All of the building tiles that you will have built will give you points, and some of those are variable depending on certain achievements that you've done during the game. You'll also score points for any gold that you have and lose points for any begging markers that you may have collected. So you add up all your points, whoever has the most points is the winner. In summary, at the beginning of each round a new action card is placed into the next available space. Replenish any resources that are shown on the action spaces. In turn order, each player will place one worker onto an action space and carry out the action. Once all workers have been placed, if the round ends in a harvest, players must harvest their crops, feed their workers, and animals will breed. This process is repeated until the last round when final scores are tallied and a winner is determined. Now Caverna is a really fantastic game. What I particularly like about this game is that there are so many different things that you can do, different paths to victory. So you may focus on the farming side of the, the game, collecting animals and building up those in order to earn points, or you might work on your cave and mines and collecting rubies and ore, etc. You may go on expeditions, that may be the focus of your game in order to, order to earn points. There's so many different paths to victory and every game you can try something a little bit different. So if you like a game that's got lots of variety, that's reasonably complex but not too difficult to learn, then Caverna may well be for you. So thanks for watching and happy gaming.